the OWASP right, yeah. Top 10 Fast and Furious. So the OWASP Top 10 is an awareness document. It's a de facto standard, which means it's not a standard. Please, in the OWASP Top 10 document, they explain what you should use this for. It's meant for education and awareness. If you need a standard, go look at the ASVS. This is still a good topic to talk about. These are all our friends here that we've seen for years in a variety of different ways in the new OAS Top 10. And here's the dance. Here's the shift where we see the different items like injection moving down, other items uh, moving up. And we have new categories, insecure design, software and data integrity failures, and server side request forgery. Let's get to work. A1. Top 10 number one is about access control. The reason being is 94% of tested apps have some kind of broken access control problem. And I think this is because access control is not something you can turnkey deploy in an app. If you want access control that handles enterprise features, you're going to have to build something custom. I'm not a fan of the turnkey access control products out there because they don't handle the hard problems like indirect object reference. Now, what's this? This is an ID on a URL to give me a, a message of some kind. And if there's no access control behind it, it's just a straight query of some kind. I modify the number and I can steal data. This is a super common problem in web development everywhere. And it's trivial to test as, a, as an attacker or a security assessor. <clears throat> and there's so many ways to fix it. This is why access control is a big problem because there's no standard way to handle this. What I do is at the when I can at the data layer, I'll add that access control in at the query level where I'm going to say, unless the current user, which I pull from session, is a, re is a recipient or the sender of that message, then I'm not going to send the message. And the, again, there's I could think of a dozen different ways to do data specific access control. There is no standard way to do this in the industry. That's why access control is number one. It's hard to get right. There's no standard for it. And and what else is it, number one? Our, our scanning tools of the era don't do a good job at figuring out what's what's wrong, right? So it's business logic domain. So a few quick tips. I want you to code to the activity. Stop hard coding roles as an enforcement point. You're merging policy and code. There's a lot of limits when you code like that. Other, other key ac uh, access control designs I usually teach in my classes, I enforce access control by the activity, not the role. I implement data-specific access control in some standard way. And it's a centralized data-driven access controller. And I designed this so all requests go through a filter and must go through my access control layer. I want to deny by default, fail securely, make sure the right data is driving access control policy. I want to change entitlements in real time and have proper grouping across my data structure. If you want to look more at the ASVS Four or five, ASVS 4.03, you can look at the access control requirements to get a little more of a nitty gritty set of details around what we should be uh, architecting for access control for our developers. And here's a link. I look at the authorization cheat sheet, NIST 800-162 for attribute-based access control and the ASVS requirements. So we're looking at the OWASP. Where are we? Hello, everybody. We're at the OWASP Top 10 2021, and we're now going to go look at A2 cryptographic failures. So th th this used to be called sensitive data exposure, but the root cause is some kind of broken crypto implementation that leads to sensitive data exposure. So this category is renamed, and the priority was raised. It's a big deal now. So much more of what we're doing is crypto-based. JSON web tokens, that's all now key management and digital signatures as a core part of identity. We need to get crypto right. Number one, TLS on everything. Is there any excuse not to use TLS? No. Want to fight me? Send me email and tell me why. I'll explain you why you're wrong. That's a little arrogant. That's unfiltered male arrogance. Let's rewind. If you have any questions about TLS and you have ideas around why you think TLS is not necessary, I'm always happy to discuss it with you professionally. Much better. Much better. We don't need unfiltered mail, mail arrogance day, none of that. We also want to use strict transport security. And, and again, commit to having this well configured everywhere we're doing, we're doing application transport. Another part of crypto is key life cycle, the uh, generation, establishment, storage, and, re, and, and, and recycling of keys and you know, uh, changing keys and similar. We want to get this right. And it's all about having a secrets management solution. We're not sticking keys on servers anymore in the database. We have formal cryptographic vaults. We should use them. They're difficult to use, though. It's hard work. 
Also, if you're going to do low-level crypto coding for Java, please don't do it yourself by hand. Use Google Tink. It's an outstanding leading crypto library in the Java, Android, C++, Objective-C, Go. And if you don't like spaces, Python, um, all, all the above are interoperable crypto with this pretty amazing library. Same thing with LibSodium. Here's some references to the transport layer cheat sheet and the cryptographic storage cheat sheet. SSL Labs, the de facto TLS analyzer for the public, and Dr. Vetter's test SSL.sh for your internal scanning needs. We're looking at the OS top 10 for injection. How do you get injection right? We're, we've talked about this for a long time. How about input validation? No, this is a legal valid email address that's a SQL injection payload. It's a, here's the regular expression for email according to the HTML5 standard. And with this legal valid email, I got a SQL injection endpoint here. Select data from customers where email is Jim or one does not equal manico.com. That's or true. I get the whole customer table. So <clears throat> look at the slide title. Even valid data can cause injection. What do you do? Always parameterize your queries, damn it, Brian. And so we want to use a question mark as a placeholder. We use our binding statement. We have uh, parameterized queries in the Java world, in the .NET world for Bill Gates. We got we got uh, Python. If you don't, I don't like I like spaces. And you get one space wrong, your Python code doesn't compile. Python, you're dead to me because of that. You're dead to me. But if you like Python, here's a parameterized query in Python. Bring it on. Every once in a while, you can't parameterize like a column name or a table name or some funky um, percent search you're doing. Make sure you have really strict exact match validation or validate down to letters and numbers only. At the, at, at, it's, it's the best we got. So just be, be aware. Sometimes you can't parameterize. The other topic is cross-site scripting when it comes to injection, which we've merged into the injection category just be aware xss defense is brutally difficult so i, I got to do escaping if i'm going to display the same data that the user typed in i got to do url validation if i'm using a user driven url to add to my ui i got to sanitize html if i'm letting authors off if i'm letting users author html and some other miscellaneous like content security policy and safe use of javascript is brutally hard it's now part of the injection category a4 insecure design there's a lot of other people who will talk prep modeling besides me. But what we're saying is so many flaws now because architecture of software is getting more complicated, that secure design is now fundamental. We, before we make big architecture changes or preferably, you ready for this? Before you write code, maybe think about your architecture. Yeah, that's threat modeling. There are there's a lot of people in the industry talking about it right now. And please be prepared if you're running a threat modeling session. Have reference architectures. Have secure designs you're trying to move developers to. Have a good model of what risk you care about. Don't just go in there and flop around like one of those nine-foot inflatable dinosaur outfits. That's, that's when you're not prepared. Go in there with reference architectures and have a plan of what you want developers to be doing. I think that's better for secure design. Don't flop around like an inflatable dinosaur. Let's move on. A5 security misconfiguration. This is a big deal. And I agree. I think this should be a higher, a higher priority, actually. But now that now we see that like 90 percent of apps we tested have some form of configuration problem. And just be aware of what the scale here is. It can span everything from passwords to file uh, to file permissions and more. Read the manual, get hardening guides, have a golden image where you've hardened that particular framework. So developers are reusing it. There's also the TLS configuration guide from Mozilla. Brilliant. Got me my A plus on SSL Labs. It's you can't get an A plus anymore. I'm only getting an A now because they dropped the A plus ranking. I think. Let's move on. XML parser needs to be configured to stop XXE and so on. Configuration is a ginormous pro, uh, a ginormous category, especially when it comes to the cloud. Read the manual. Get hardening guides. Take your configuration seriously. A six vulnerable outdated components. This is something we've known since 2013 as a top tier issue. What do we got here? Here we have WordPress with an insecure third-party library this year, critical issue. Drupal third-party library, critical issue. Some of the biggest frameworks in the world have this problem. So please use a scanner of some kind. Scan, scan, scan. Make sure you're not allowing production quality. Make sure you're not allowing insecure libraries in production. Here's a bunch of open source tools. Consider who else should we consider for your third-party management scanning? You know. 
You know who you should be considering in the commercial world. There's really one big player, only one big player in the commercial world for third-party scanning. In my opinion, I'm blind to everything else. A7, identification and authentication failures. Another ginormous category here. So what is authentication? Proving the identity of a user. What's a session? That's how we track users, either with a JSON web token stateless or a traditional session stateful. And there are Uber categories here we got to think about when it comes to authentication. Again, a ginormous category. How strong should your authentication be? That's a big question I get asked. Number one, look at Daniel Meisler's consumer authentication strengths maturity model. Really granular take on this topic. Also take a look at NIST 863B. Hooah! This is the digital media authentication standard from U.S. government. Everyone should read this. It's a valuable document. And we clearly see... Right here, if you're playing with sensitive data, you should at least have some form of multi-factor for all your users. The era of passwords is over. If you got sensitive data and your password security, put some multi-factor on that. When it comes to password policy, NIST defined a whole new set of rules about passwords so we can drop special character rules and check against common passwords or breach passwords in other areas Password security has changed. How they're attacked have changed. Be aware of the new NIST rules and consider them. Also, how do I store a password if I'm building my own system? Well, we have a good cheat sheet. Password storage cheat sheet. Really be using Argon 2 ID with these configuration settings at the minimum for password storage. Identity is a giant, giant topic. And please be sure that uh, we're really moving in the direction of identity providers and good frameworks that do it for us as opposed, as opposed to writing it from scratch. We're looking at A8, software and data integrity failures. So th there's a couple topics here. First of all, we have deserialization, which is a data integrity failure to, to some degree. Also, the whole issue here is really, think about this. How many scripts do you download from another provider every day and run on one of your servers? That's becoming a really large number. So we're asking that when you pull down scripts to run, do two checks. Check against the hash, published hash of that script, but also go look at that provider's GitHub repo if it's public and make sure the content hasn't changed based on what you're downloading. So I like to do as much data integrity checking on my crazy scripts I'm running from providers these days. We see CodeCov and other, and other providers who had big problems in this area, which led to pretty big mess. We're now looking at A9, security logging and monitoring. I want to point you to the application logging vocabulary cheat sheet donated to the OWASP Foundation by Nike Corp. This defines a vocab of what security events developers should log. It's a great starting point for your knock, your, your sock or knock or sock knock or whatever you're doing with your developers. So they agree on a logging standard. So when your network operation team onboards applications, they're actually looking at application logs for security events. We have, again, the vocab cheat sheet and the traditional logging cheat sheet, more, more information about more information about like what not to log as well. Last but not least, server side request forgery. So this is a new category that the data doesn't really back up, but the community is clear of security researchers that we have to care about SSRF. The big incident, I think, was from Capital One. An attacker modified a URL here. So we're almost done for the day. So, but the attacker modified the URL, which is meant to be a public resource embedded over a server-side include, and changed it to an AWS resource where they got the AWS password. And by the way, the WAF was bypassed to steal the WAF password to log into the S3 bucket to steal 100 million credit card records. What would Morpheus say about that? He would say, life, it seems, is not without a sense of irony. This is an amazing case study on server side request forgery. I've also seen SSRF at my friends at GitLab. I've seen it at uh, Microsoft Exchange. No one's innocent. This is a hard vulnerability that leads to infrastructure level attacks. And so here's all my advice on SSRF. Number one, make sure your intranet APIs have great authentication. Make sure you have great access control on your backend APIs. If you're gonna have a server act on a URL that you take as a parameter, now either do strong validation or just don't do that. Server side includes are old school. We can do better. 
Also, if you're going to build a URL that's partly static data and partly request data, URL encode your parameter of untrusted data as you add it to a URL. And my friends at Netflix have taught me, and I agree with them, consider network security tools around your services to limit what kind of outbound and inbound requests they're allowed to take to limit this as well. We, so we did it. That's the OWASP Top 10 2021 in a nutshell. Develop secure code, folks. Use an ASVS standard and the Cheat Sheet series to give you references as an engineer on how to write secure code and test continuously. We have Zap and some OWASP tools. We have a great provider hosting this, this conference you should consider. We also have the web security testing guide from OWASP. That's it. 15 minutes or le- approximately 15 minutes of the OWASP Top 10. That's oh my my God. story, oh. and I'm sticking to it. Oh, my God, that was fast. And uh, for everybody who wants to review that, maybe maybe you do that on YouTube later on and, and cut down the, 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 the pace as twice yeah, as slow. Most people do it t- twice as fast. Catch up. I find that. I'll slow it down. Uh, but, Jim. Catch um, up, Ryan. Catch up, Ryan. Come on. I know, I know, I know. I know. One, one question. We've got one minute left. Um, I see in 2021 some um, categories are blend together or got taken apart. What's the reason? Yes. For that? So, uh, so uh, XXE, a well, previous 2017 yeah. category, was rolled into configuration issues, which is all it is. XX, yeah. XML attacks or configure your XML parser right, number one. Um, Cross site scripting, now that we understand the topic really well and how to fight it, that's been rolled into injection. I agree. Because we didn't really understand how to stop cross-site scripting until the last couple of years. We got we got the whole strategy now, right? Content security policy escaping, HTML sanitization is built in the frameworks. We have the knowledge now, so now we've merged it into injection. And deserialization was rolled into the new software and data integrity category as well. Deserialization type stuff, which I don't see as a big problem that much anymore. No. It's rare, rare where I run into it now that the core Java files and similar have, have been fixed. Yeah, there makes, you go. Makes a, makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you, Jim. This was amazing. And I will definitely take this one and look it back like m- multiple times. I need and to catch up. Brian, I teach, I'm, I'm going to do a little, a little, a little 10 second pitch. I teach secure coding classes for a living. I'm always looking for opportunities to teach your developers. Please contact me at jim at manacode.com. If you're interested in secure coding education. All right, I'm done. That's my okay. answer. Thank you so much, Jim. Thanks. As always, always entertaining, um, always educational. We learned something great. And thank you again for being involved. And just one more thing. I want to let you know I am pro salad. I'm pro I just want you to know that I'm pro salad. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. I mean, this friendship would have been a bit touch and go. Cheers. Okay. <laughs>